And over to you, Mark, and you to do it. Yeah, Great. Okay. Well, thanks for the invitation to talk. So I'm going to be recording this, so if you miss any of it, you can watch it on YouTube tomorrow. <laughs> um, if you go to my YouTube channel. Um, so what I'm going to do is just give a brief introduction to high throughput sequencing, look at some applications in clinical microbiology, then to take two case studies from our work, Acinetobacter and E. coli, and at the end I'm going to start to be very provocative and talk about what I would see as the future of microbiology um, in this direction. So what is high throughput sequencing? Well, in fact, we've just written a review which has come out on high throughput sequencing in uh, bacterial genomics. This is a, a set of technologies which allow us to do things at least 100 times faster than 100 times cheaper, probably more like 10,000 times cheaper and faster than conventional sequencing. It can be argued that it's a, effectively a disruptive technology because it just changes the landscape so much that you have to rethink everything you're doing. Fundamentally, new approaches to what used to be done, where you used to have to clone into E. coli and plasmids and all that kind of stuff. And there are several uh, technologies in the marketplace with lively competition between them. And uh, we've argued that we're in a state of permanent revolution here. Someone comes to me and says, I want to do some sequencing on, and I want to put down some costings on a grant in, th in the third year of the grant. How much will it cost, you say? I've no idea. I can tell you how much it would cost if you wanted to do it this week or this month, but three years, no idea. Uh, and some people uh, have spoken about Hypermore's Law. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you look at the cost of uh, sequencing, it was effectively following Moore's Law. Here, this is Moore's Law, which applies to computers, which the doubling of, of capacity and performance over every 18 months or so. That's the way sequencing was until high throughput sequencing came in uh, about five years ago, and then suddenly the slope of the curve changed dramatically and is massively now outperforming Moore's Law. In fact, being provocative, uh, I've pointed out that effectively we are on a trajectory here where we will reach very soon what we might call the sing sequencing singularity, where sequencing becomes so cheap that it becomes the preferred technology for everything um, that you might think of. And it's just so cheap to, to meter that... Um, I mean, you can speculate what, what would the cost of uh, sequencing a, a one megabase bacterial genome be. Currently, in terms of sequencing, it's about 10 cents in terms of purely of sequencing. But by the time I retire, it might be... Um, we might be talking about doing hundreds or thousands for a dollar... Um, and doing the whole you know, 30,000 or 50,000 isolates you might have a year uh, for very small amounts of money. In the, rec in the last year and a half or so, uh, we've seen actually this uh, re renewed vigour here with the, the advent of benchtop sequencing. So we have these um, instruments here which are about the size of a laser printer and they uh, have a turnaround time and, and consumables costs, which mean that they are suited to um, small-scale use, small uh, labs and so forth. Um, and sequencing obviously has many advantages because it brings this open-endedness. You can find it unknown unknowns. You don't have to know what you're looking for. If you design a PCR, you have to say, oh, I want to have a PCR for the sugar toxin gene and so forth. Where with sequencing, you just find what's there. Uh, all organisms have DNA or RNA. You know, prions, obviously, as an infectious agent, don't. But, but generally, it will work on almost everything you can look at. And obviously, gives the ultimate in resolution. This is a rather busy figure <coughs> from our recent review. It just points out the... I'm just using it to point out the kind of workflow. So with the current technologies, you have genomic DNA. You fragment this. You then tag it. And then you have various solid phase amplification steps, either on beads or on a solid two-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface, um, and then you do the sequencing. There are actually some technologies which go away, do away with all that, where you can actually do what we call single molecule sequencing, where you don't have to do this amplification first. But at the moment, those are still rather niche technologies, but they that will change, as I might say, towards the end of time. 
Uh, and as you can see, there are various instruments, and they're all in competition with each other. This uh, is a cut-down version of one of the tables from that review, and again, it's a very busy table, and I'm not going to go through it all in detail. The point here is that in terms of runtime costs, uh, well, amount uh, throughput per run, uh, the costs, read lengths, there are differences between these platforms, but no one platform is absolutely perfect at the moment for all applications, and so you have to make a choice uh, based on what uh, mm -hmm. your applications are. Now, moving on to applications in bacteriology, uh, in the last uh, probably about three or four years now, we have seen the birth of genomic epidemiology for bacteria. Um, and here are some of the early uh, examples of this, where in support of the investigation into the Amerithrax incident, the deliberate release of anthrax into the American postal system, <coughs> whole genome sequencing was carried out. Uh, and this actually was involved in uh, resolving that investigation so that they managed to find what, where was the culture that uh, was used to um, propagate that incident and who was looking after that. The guy actually committed suicide, so there hasn't been a trial, but uh, the Department of Justice in the US has closed that investigation. Um, very political thing in Haiti with the Haitian cholera, where genome sequencing there very quickly showed that those uh, cholera, Vibrio cholerae isolates from Haiti did not resemble those from the rest of the Caribbean or from South America, but instead were most closely related for, to those from, from Asia, uh, and the subsequent paper actually ratcheted it down to, uh, to the Indian subcontinent and pointed the finger at the Nepalese peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers who were there, and that had quite political uh, ramifications in Haiti. This is a bit of whimsy. Uh, Stuart Cole and his colleagues have shown that if you take uh, human cases of leprosy and you sequence the genome of the leprosy bacilli, or at least look for the SNPs that you, that you recognize that you, know, that you already know about, in those isolates of Mycobacterium leprae, and then you look at armadillos in the US, you find that there are cases where humans have acquired leprosy from armadillos. And the usual way they do that is that there are some strange people in the southern United States who actually go and kill and eat armadillos. And, and so, basically, if you go to New Orleans or the Deep South and, and, and they offer you something you don't recognize, then maybe you should turn it down. Um, this is just an illustrative list. There's, there's plenty of other examples out there. Here's some that are perhaps closer to home in terms of hostile infection, looking at neonatal MRSA outbreaks, a staph aureus carriage and how it progresses, a looking at benchtop sequencing and its applications with C. diff and staph aureus. Now what I'm going to do now is just give you some uh, examples from our own work. Um, so one organism that we've been looking at uh, over the last <coughs> few years is, is Acinetobacter baumani. I know I understand that this is an organism that is not unknown to you uh, here. Uh, Gram-negative bacillus, multi-drug resistant, moving towards pan resistance, associated with wound infections, ventilator associated with pneumonia bloodstream, particularly associated with returning military personnel from Iraq initially and now more recently from Afghanistan. Uh, back 10 years, just under 10 years ago, it was actually being dubbed the Iraqi Bacta, and there were lots of uh, campaigning about it. It's gone a little bit quieter, but in Birmingham, all of the military casualties get repatriated to, to our hospitals with a QE, so we do see this as an issue there. And particularly there's a problem where, because now the military are, we don't have our own set of military hospitals or military wards, there is this risk of military uh, patients uh, cross-infecting civilians. So we uh, set out to look at a, a number of questions um, in terms of epidemiology and the emergence of resistance. So... If we sequence the whole genome of, uh, of these bacteria, could we detect differences between isolates within an outbreak? I just reminded myself actually saying that if there's any virologists in the audience, you can be as smug as you like because we bacteriologists realise that you've been sequencing genomes and doing gene genomic epidemiology for, for years and we're kept playing catch up with you. But then our genomes are 10 or 100 times larger than yours. But 
this is a question, this is what, and uh, you know, we were one of the first teams to actually start looking at this issue and, and could we use these high throughput technologies on the hospital infections and look at differences within isolates within an outbreak. And could we then look at those differences and actually reconstruct chains of transmission between patients <coughs> in the outbreak? And then uh, the third question there was, can we see how resistance might emerge uh, within a particular lineage uh, and shed light on that. So there was an outbreak in uh, Celio Hospital uh, back in 2008. The hospital's now closed, but that was where we used to have all our military patients and civilian patients and, and everyone. And uh, the isolates from that outbreak were indistinguishable. We sent them to Collindale, they said, yeah, we've got an outbreak, they're all the same, we can't tell the difference between them. Um, and we've written this up, in case anyone's interested, it's quite an old paper now. Um, and we used a technology 454 sequencing and we did six isolates um, and we then did SNP detection mapping these uh, looking for single <coughs> nucleotide polymorphism single base pair changes within those genomes we went through to a lot of trouble to make sure we weren't confusing ourselves because if you're looking for one in a million changes if your error rate is, is at all uh, appreciable, then you may well be getting false positives. So we made very careful, took very careful steps to avoid that. In fact, we went back and resequenced any SNP that we'd found through the high throughput sequencing uh, by conventional approaches. What did we find? Well, we found that those isolates were, dis in, were distinguishable only three loci in the genome, and there were these three SNPs and these this. Here is a completely unrelated Acinetobacter, which we used as a way of working out what the ancestral state would have been in those, in those particular positions. And one of our isolates seemed to have that ancestral state. The other isolates had um, uh, one or two SNPs different from that. Now, when you look at that, you, you might be thinking, well, this is... Uh, I can't interpret that, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, one thing I should say is that M stands for military and C for civilian, so these are four military patients, two civilian patients. It does actually start to make a bit more sense, though, when you actually superimpose those SNP genotypes on what we know about the time and space aspects of this outbreak. <coughs> so the majority of patients were in a six-bedded unit within the intensive care unit. Uh, there was one out on the main ITU shuffle between them. And there was one out here on the trauma unit who had nothing to do with all the others. And if you look there, there are two patients on that ITU who have uh, uh, the very same genotype, this TAG genotype. And so we made, um, on the basis of parsimony, um, a conclusion that this patient M2 had given the infection to C2. And they were together in adjacent beds for a period of time. This one came first, this one came second, and that was our conclusion. Now, you've, you, you will be thinking, well, hang on, this is silly. This is a sledgehammer to crack a nut. All that genome sequencing to tell you something you could have just kind of guessed anyway. It's not rocket science, is it? Um, but we didn't know when we started whether we would get any changes at all between these, whether we would see anything that was interpretable at all, whether we might just see tens of thousands of variants and then it was all just a mess. So we were actually quite heartened by that. Now, if anyone's actually really concentrating, you might have noticed, actually, there's another patient. This patient down here has got the same genotype and he's nowhere near this. So how do we account for that? Well, we actually went and looked at the records and it turned out that these two patients here, these two military patients, had actually been repatriated through the same care pipeline, particular pathway, uh, from Afghanistan and arrived at the hospital together. And so we uh, assume that they actually came in together, both uh, colonised with the same genotype that they'd acquired en route to the hospital, and that accounted for, uh, for these patterns of, 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 uh, of SNP types. So here's a study that we did with David and others, uh, people at, in, in, in Collindale. Uh, and here there were... Uh, isolates from a, s a single patient that were genome sequenced. One of those isolates was taken before the patient received tiger cycling therapy and that isolate was susceptible. Um, there was a second isolate that was taken after therapy where it had become resistant. Uh, as is often the case with 
research projects, there were sort of certain kind of accents of history. It turned out they four five four sequence this one and Lumina sequence that one for no no obvious reason. But nonetheless, we were able to put the two technologies together and work out what had happened between those two um, uh, isolates. And what we found here was that actually there were 18 SNPs between the two. Uh, and nine of them were non-synonymous that affected amino acids. One of those actually included a SNP in the gene ADS, which was known to be involved as a, a part of a two-component regulation regulating a resistance phenotype, an efflux pump, in that particular uh, species. And so that made sense. So that gave us a nice explanation as to how resistance had emerged. But the other interesting thing is that when you think about the emergence of resistance, you normally think about organisms acquiring new DNA. So they acquire plasmids that bring in resistance determinants and so forth. But that's not what happens here, actually. The later isolate had three deletions uh, compared to the earlier isolate. So it lost DNA. One of those deletions actually uh, truncated uh, a DNA repair gene called MUT-S. And we uh, concluded from that that what had happened was that this had led to an increase in, music, uh, in mutation rate, um, and that was a precursor in this lineage for the acquisition of these SNPs, that, one of which then went on to give resistance. So it accounts for the fact that in this lineage, we're seeing actually a, a large, much larger number of SNPs being acquired in a relatively short period of time compared to what we'd seen in the previous outbreak. And interestingly, just in the last uh, few months or so, um, Sharon Peacock in Cambridge has also reported a similar phenomenon in a completely different organism, in Staphylococcus aureus. She's seen an increase in the, resist in, in the, in the mutation rate in a MUT-S uh, mutant background. Uh, and so it seems... Th uh, and you see this kind of thing also with cancer, when you have the emergence of a cancer one of the early steps is you lose DNA repair mechanisms which lead to a much higher mutation rate and then that uh, paves the way for all the things that happen later on in terms of uh, carcinogenesis. So it's, it's interesting to see that these kind of general phenomena crop, cropping up here. Now, more recently we've had another outbreak. We have a pattern in Birmingham of what we might call serial clonal outbreaks. So we get introduction of an Acinetobacter baumani into the hospital Things sputter on for a few months, or in worst case like this, for over a year, and then eventually it goes away. David tells me that here you're not so fortunate and you have Acinetobacter always there, and it never goes away. <laughs> a, bit better. Huh? a bit better now. A bit better than that now? Okay, well that's what you told me about a year or two. New, New hospital, okay, yeah. Well, anyway, I presented this at uh, ICAC and Vanya Gant told me, hang on, how have you had all this going on for so long that your infection control is, is, is a criminally negligent and you should all be shot. You know. So we can't uh, at all be uh, sanctimonious about it. We're, this is actually a bit of out of date slide now. This is, the actual outbreak's finished uh, a couple of months ago, we think. We haven't seen anything recently. Uh, but there were, have been deaths linked to it. And um, again, the HPA <coughs> reference lab said, yeah, you've got an outbreak. It's all one unique pulse type 27. And so we managed to get 69 isolates from 29 patients, including uh, some of the multiples from the same patient, different time and body sites. And uh, the clinical lab actually did feed us a couple of unrelated isolates just to sort of <coughs> test us out. They didn't tell us. And we came back and said, hang on, these two are ridiculously far away. They've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of SNPs. They're not part of your app. And they said, yeah, we know that. We're just testing it. Again, this is out of date now. We've actually sequenced the majority of these isolates, so we're just about to finish up the, the sequencing anyway. Now, one argument you can have is, OK, well, this sequencing is very well, but shoe leather epidemiology, that's still the best way to do it. Well, if you look at, you know, who's been on the same ward with whom at the same time, you get this, I think this is sometimes called a furball, uh, you know, trying to unpick what actually's gone on here from just that those... Uh, com uh, um, co-occurrences in time and space, uh, is, uh, a coincidence in time and space, is, is, is going to be impossible. So we've done, actually, uh, since I prepared these slides, I've done a few more, but we did six MySeq runs, uh, 36 isolates between, and at best uh, we can get this to go from 
get all this done within four or five days from receipt, receipt of the sample. Now, we didn't do it that way. We batched them up and so forth. But uh, the technology and the, and, the, and the workflow is such that you could do it in less than a week, a working week, if you wanted to. And we identified 14 high-quality SNPs among all of the isolates, and they're listed there. I'm not going to go into any details. But uh, what we then have done, and this is Jacqueline Chan in my group have has been working uh, on this with a biophysician, Mike Halachev, to try and thread the SNP types onto what we know about the time and space aspects of the outbreak. And this is a work in progress, and quite how you display this best and so forth is still... Um, yet to be worked out, but this is a first uh, attempt. So we have the early, uh, what we think is the index case here, military patient, two military patients here, and then various transmission events, some of these coloured in, where it makes sense, where the patients are on the same ward at the same time, they overlapped, it, 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 it's plausible. So each of these arrows represents one SNP being acquired. So a snip between here and here, another snip between here and here, another snip between there and there, and so forth. Now, there have been a few cases where you sort of scratch your head and say, well, actually, we can't work out that patient's on that ward, that patient's on that ward, but they, they're only the same snip type or they're one snip different, what's going on? Um, and in those cases, we've been delving into the records in the, in the hospital and getting the hospital informaticians to give us every piece of data we can, and we're trying to make sense of that. One thing I should say is that if you look at the, this is the kind of arrow of time, and one of the heartening things is that the index, if we compare all of these isolates to the index case, you see a stepwise acquisition of SNPs as the outbreak continues, which is what you'd expect if this, if this were behaving as a kind of molecular clock, that these were, mutations were being steadily acquired. That the, the counter argument that some people have said is, well, you don't know that these mutations don't just randomly occur when you subculture in the laboratory. And if that were the case, we wouldn't see this nice progression here. You can see that in some patients, uh, well, I think the next slide shows that. So we, we've, uh, this one here, uh, although it seems to be a derivative, this cluster actually came out beforehand, was isolated beforehand. That underlines the fact that just because you've isolated their lineage at a particular time, it doesn't mean that's when the lineage actually emerged. It may have been there in the background all the time. And so we have to be careful about the way in which we interpret these things. Here, this, this three complex to six and seven, we think that they weren't on the same ward, but they did share some equipment, and we think that's a potential route. And similarly, there's a, some other transmissions here where we think it could be that they've been to the same... Burns Theatre, Plastics and Burns Theatre, uh, at the, it, you know, on the same day. I don't know if they're actually adjacent uh, in time when they were actually in the theatre, but uh, that provides us. So we're, this is still a work in progress, and it, it, it's uh, the kind of iterative thing going, going back to the records, and, and, and I guess anyone who's worked in the hospital knows that actually trying to work out when the patient was on in a particular bed uh, and how long they were there for before they moved to another bed, it's actually quite hard to get all that information. <clears throat> Interestingly, this patient 18 was positive for a long time, and the first isolate was in this complex here, but there have been a couple of other isolates that have, uh, well, three isolates that have one snip different from that, um, suggesting that you can have evolution within the patient, or patients can carry more than one snip type. So again, as we're learning, as we're doing this, we're kind of updating our expectations and assumptions. And again, Sharon Peacock has seen the same, that you can see multiple SNP types in Staph aureus in the same patient. And so, and so we have to uh, be careful in our interpretations there. Okay, I'm now going to move on from Asni to back to, uh, to a second case study, which is uh, German E. coli 0104H4 the so-called sprout break, because it was associated with uh, sprouting seeds, uh, fenugreek seeds. So this took place in, in May to July of last year, uh, over 4,000 cases and over 40, I think it's over 50 deaths now, um, linked to sprouting seeds after some false starts with cucumbers being indicated at one stage, which caused a lot of trouble in, with the Spanish economy. But it was the sprouting seeds which finally were, were uh, identified as the, as the vehicle. 
very high risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome, so sugar toxin producing strain, and for some reason females were particularly at risk, both of actually getting diarrhea and getting the hemolytic uremic syndrome, and we don't really know why. Uh, one explanation may be that real men don't eat bean sprouts. So. <laughs> That's just a spurious explanation. You can see that the outbreak was concentrated up here around Hamburg and in, in, in northern Germany, although it was, there were cases reported from all over Germany and from many other countries outside Germany as people left Germany and went back to other places or went on holiday. I think there were five isolates made in, in the UK uh, from this outbreak. And this just shows the epidemic curve there uh, at its worst in the third week in May. Uh, and then kind of petering out uh, through towards the end of June. Now, at the centre of this uh, outbreak was this guy here, Dr. Holger Roder, who works at the University Clinic, Hamburg Eppendorf. Uh, he, you know, it was just absolute chaos in the hospital because these patients were just turning up. They had not enough, didn't have enough uh, bed pans. They didn't have enough wards for them, and all that. And he, in the lab, was inundated with all these samples coming in. But he kept his cool, and he thought, I need help with this. And so he called International Rescue. Now, those of a certain age will know that when you call International Rescue, Thunderbirds are go. <laughs> and he got help from the international community. Some of it, in a way, he anticipated, but some of it, in a way, he didn't anticipate. So, in fact, through a uh, postdoc that they had working there, that they that, that, that worked with them, they had a link through to the uh, Chinese Genomics Institute, BGI, which is now the largest genomics institute in the world. And it didn't actually go on Thunderbird 2. It went by conventional air freight. <laughs> but the DNA from the outbreak strain went from Hamburg to BGI in Shenzhen, not far from Hong Kong. Now, it happened that uh, BGI had just acquired one of these instruments, uh, uh, an iron torrent PGM, one of the first of these uh, benchtop instruments, and, and they thought, well, let's just try it out. So they ran the, the DNA through that instrument and got a result very quickly, you know, kind of a, you know, overnight, uh, within a single day. And um, then they did something that was quite remarkable. They released their data onto the internet completely freely. They just get this idea, here's, here's our, our, the, 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 the reads from this genome sequence from this particular uh, outbreak strain. And it so happens that Nick Lohman, who works in my group, was at a conference uh, looking at application of genomics to epidemiology uh, in bacteriology and in public health, and he wrote a blog post where he said to the people, look, they've just released, the guys in China have just released this stuff. Um, why don't we set up a little, what we call a wiki, a little place where you can put information and store it. Um, and he said, well, he, what he did was he assembled the data uh, into uh, an assembly based on those, those reads. And the reason he was in a position to do that was actually I'd, a few months earlier I'd actually won one of these iron torrent instruments in an open competition of one of two people out of 150 entries in Europe to win one. And we were just gearing up to how to analyse bacterial genome data from that particular platform. So he was extremely well placed to just get on and assemble it. But he put this challenge out to all of the bioinformaticians and the world community and said, let's have a play, see what we can make of this data. And then something quite remarkable happened. Within 24 hours of, of, of its release, he'd assembled the genome. But within two days, a guy called, uh, well, he blogs under the name of Mike the Mad Biologist, his real name is Mike Feldgarten. He'd gone and looked at that data and done some virtual MLST on it and said, well, this is, despite what the, the guys at BGI and elsewhere are saying about this being a completely new strain, like the Andromeda strain that had come from nowhere, it actually is very similar to a strain that had been isolated in Germany a few years before. Within five days, a strain-specific diagnostic test had been released, so a series of PCRs that targeted particular genes associated with that lineage. And within a week, there were over two dozen reports on the biology and evolution of the strain that had been filed on the open source wiki. Uh, and here's just a screen dump from there. So all these people communicating via Twitter and, and blogs and so forth. And it's probably two, 
the screen's too uh, small for you to, to, to read, but there are profusion of people from lots of different backgrounds. So we had people from America, people from Australia, people from Hong Kong. We had people with Muslim names, people with Polish names, Chinese names. It really was an international effort. Um, and all of the, many of those people were actually not employed to be public health epidemiologists, biomedicians, whatever. They just thought, well, this is interesting, and they got, got their, they rolled their sleeves up and got on with it. Now, when uh, Nick told me all this was happening um, and was trying to get me excited about it, I said, well, it is exciting, but, you know, we live in a harsh academic environment, and a few blog posts and a few tweets are not going to do anything for our ref submission, and this is all just, you know, froth and you should do some proper work and get some papers written. He said, why do you have to be such a grumpy old man? <clears throat> you know, why can't you embrace this? And I said, well, all right, let's have a look. And so we spoke to the German guys and, uh, and, and, and the guys in, in, in BGI, and we uh, managed to corral it all together into a paper that we uh, that was submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine, included a case study of a family outbreak, I said, well, what we need to do is not just make this a genome sequence paper, but we need to talk about all this crowdsourcing and how we got to the conclusions we got to and how exciting all that was. We did have some issues because there were, I don't know, probably at least two dozen people involved in the crowdsourcing, and we thought we can't have two dozen <coughs> extra authors, uh, particularly as it was a three-way negotiation between UK, Germany, and, and BGI, um, and we had to draw a line somewhere. And I still feel uncomfortable about where we drew the line. Um, but we drew a line at the top, the first four people to actually do any crowdsourcing to get the four big stories out. But to in, ensure consistency, Nick Lohman actually repeated everything in-house and, and validated all the conclusions. It was a right piece of work because he did it in 48 hours, effectively. And, and I redrafted it in a similar period of time, but we managed to get ourselves a nice New England Journal paper. Um, it actually went out back to back with another New England Journal paper on the same uh, kind of issue, using a different technology, using the so-called PAC Bio technology. Dave Rasko as the lead author on that one. We actually put down as an author the E. coli 104H4 genome analysis crowdsorting consortium, and then we named those people. I was, as I say, a little unhappy about that, that we couldn't you know, make them full authors, but in fact, when it went into PubMed, it's very nice that they actually got named as collaborators down here, so they're actually named in the thing. So the takeaway messages from that outbreak and from the, this analysis is that infection still presents a threat even in the most advanced societies. You know, you don't get a higher standard of living than you get in Germany, and, but still infection's a problem. And the, Passports don't, uh, pathogens don't bother with passports. This is a strain that was seen in Germany, but also something similar was seen in Korea. And in fact, when you looked at what had been genome sequenced already, the closest genome sequence strain was actually isolated in the Central African Republic from patients who were HIV positive. It belonged to an interagglutive lineage, which was rather which unexpected. So normally, sugar toxin-inducing E. coli, we think about E. coli 157 and intrahemorrhagic E. coli and so on. This actually came from a different lineage entirely. And what that led us to conclude is that this is probably coming from human populations, or at least we, can't, uh, we shouldn't be looking and concentrating on an animal source. So if you had E. coli 0157, you'd say, oh, well, there must be some cow pats in the area that have got into the food chain somehow or other. But here you had to keep a much more open mind. Bacteria evolve quickly, so virulence factors jumping around, uh, pathotypes overlapping and evolving. So it was a, a sugar toxin producing E. coli that also happened to be um, an interagglutive E. coli. It also, unfortunately, turned out to be antibiotic resistance E. coli because it, it was a, an ESBL producer, even though nobody was using antibiotics and there was no rationale what, what had selected for this. Uh, here are some of the uh, regions of difference we found between uh, this and the closest relative. There's profiles she's got in there, including the sugar toxin coding part. 
So we, we kind of got quite excited. We, we actually wrote this up called it Open Source Genomics, where we said, well, you know, basically you've got the high throughput genomics, you've got crowdsourced analyses going on, and a very liberal approach to data release. So when people had done their analyses, instead of keeping them themselves, they would just post them freely. And I think we did establish that social media like blogging and Twitter and so forth can augment the usual channels of academic discourse. So my grumpy old man phenotype of saying Twitter's a waste of time, you've got attention deficit disorder, concentrate on your work, well, that's probably misguided. Uh, and uh, it's clear that you, you can use these for good. In a sense, we're harnessing the kind of swarm brain of humanity against this, the kind of microbial masses here to try and outwit them. Have we actually broken the mould in terms of the way in which research is done? Well, I suspect not. People will still keep their lab books closed and, uh, until the last minute, until publication comes, uh, in most cases. But I think in public health emergencies, this is now going to be the norm. And in fact, we weren't the first uh, in this area. Similar things have been done with pandemic flu in terms of genome sequencing and early release and so forth. So I think it is <coughs> going to be the way forward. Do you put stuff up on blogs or do you actually uh, put your results out only in a publication? Well, one of the, there's this rule called the Inglefinger rule that the New England <coughs> Journal has, which is that from an old editor of the New England Journal called Inglefinger, who said that anything that had been published elsewhere would never be allowed to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It has to be in the New England Journal of Medicine appearing for the first time. Well, all this stuff had appeared on blogs and everything else, so the stories that we told in the paper had all been told already. But nonetheless, New England Journal took it. So I don't know whether that's changed uh, the way in which things are done. Anyway, here's us celebrating with our German collaborators here and with Dave Rasko drinking some champagne. On the back of that, uh, well, in parallel with that study, we were uh, talking to John Wayne, who I gather came here last week, uh, about you know how can we capitalise within the UK on the fact that you've got some isolates from this outbreak. And we, we thought, well, actually, these new benchtop sequences just coming on the stream, nobody really knows how they compare with each other and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Why don't we do a comparison? So we did. And very luckily, our plan B, as well as our plan A, came to fruition, and we got a paper together in, new, in, in uh, Nature Biotechnology where we compared the performance of these instruments on uh, this E. coli outbreak strain. I'm not going to go through that paper in any detail, Nick Lohman can take you through the technicalities sometime if you're interested. But one clear thing is that uh, in terms of cost, uh, the 454 is a, a, a grossly an outlier. And this technology is so, so expensive that one would have to question why anyone would want to use it. Um, I notice that you've got one, but you haven't been using it, so I hear, because it costs too much. I don't know. We don't speak the 454 anymore. Um, we don't speak the Iron Time either. Um, this, this is uh, the, the only slide I'm going to show, the only table I'm going to show from that paper. This is where I said to Nick, look, you've got to go away and do a real world type uh, analysis. As, as someone interested in what these technologies can tell us about the biology of the organism, we need some kind of test. So we, we took a, a, a few dozen genes that we thought were of interest, to, would be of interest, like MLST, loci, those kind of things. And we said, if you use this sequencing instrument and this platform and, and, and so forth, and then you use various kind of assemblers, what results would you get? Would you get all of those genes assembled into a single sequence or not? And the answer is that none of these technologies, uh, these platforms, pipelines, gave perfect results. Um, there were these things called spates, which are highly repetitive, long, highly repetitive genes, uh, and they gave us some problems. You know, even the best approaches are still breaking two of those into, into, into fragments. But there was considerable variation. These were doing not too badly. 90, around 95% of things were coming out OK. At the worst case, with the Iron Tonic Junior using a, 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 this particular assembly, you were getting half of that. So it's clear that there were quite a lot of differences between platforms in their performance. And we used this to change our attitude to what platforms we were going to adopt in the future. OK, the last 10 minutes or so, 5 to 10 minutes, I'm going to just uh, now start to get even more provocative. Now, 
You could argue that we're in the era of microbiology 1.0 at the moment, or maybe 1.1 if you include a little bit of PCR and automation. And this was actually established in, in the 1880s. Uh, these two papers here, one from Robert Koch, which established the importance of using solid media and, um, and picking pure colonies, uh, pure cultures. He obviously wrote the original German. This is the ASM actually translated it a few years ago. Um, so you can download it. But. And then uh, this guy Christian Graham invented the Graham stain, which we still use uh, in the laboratory in 1884. And uh, again, that was published in German, but you can get the English translation. <coughs> Since then, nothing much has changed, has it, really? I mean, we've got a bit of automation, perhaps, but it's just, just more of the same. So, what, what I'm proposing now is we have microbiology 2.0, which we might call clinical metagenomics, which is that we just sequence the, the shit, let's say. We just take this stuff here and we turn it into sequence... And high throughput sequencing becomes our method of choice, and medical microbiology becomes just a branch of clinical chemistry or genomic medicine. Now, some of you will be fuming with rage at me at saying that. I'm just following a groove. This is the thought experiment. We'll see where it leads. I'm not suggesting that everything's going to happen overnight or that it will work in every case, but you know, let's see where it goes. In fact, we just had a... Uh, there's a review coming out, or a commentary coming out in um, Nature Biotech was in a next month where we said you know basically the current workflow looks a bit like this you've got your sample you've got your microscopy your culture you're doing all this stuff what's been proposed up to now with all that genomic epidemiology stuff is you're still culturing the pathogens and then sequen sequencing them and that you know that's coming in it seems to be working and it's kind of a lot of interest in it but we could go beyond that and we could actually say, well, let's just not even bother to culture anything. Let's just extract DNA from the sample and sequence it and see what we can, we can come up with. Now, again, all respect to the virologists because they always get there first. But they do deal with simpler organisms. Uh, there's been a, a number of proof of principle papers showing that indeed this works. So here's one where a new arena virus was discovered it was an outbreak in an intensive care unit, and they took tissues and they extracted RNA and they sequenced it. And obviously, they got lots and lots of human reads, but they found in it some viral reads, and they said, ah, oh, we've got it. There have been similar things done with Ebola virus, for example. Here's one <coughs> um, looking at viral pathogens in nasal and fecal specimens, showing that, yes, indeed, you can detect virus uh, sequences just by this brute force approach of extracting DNA and then just sequencing all of it. Or, 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 see, or making cDNA and then sequencing into it. <coughs> so we're in the process of writing up a paper. It was going to go to New England Journal, but we're now probably going to go to, the, to, to JAMA, looking at diagnostic metagenomics for bacterial infection. And this is still a work in progress, so we've wrote this first draft and sent it off to the editor, and he said, hmm, you need a few, it's a bit underpowered, you need a few more samples. And we said, well, hang on, there was this paper just published where they sequenced two newborn babies, their genomes, and said, oh, this can tell you what is the cause of their congenital uh, condition, N equals two. And this is so, it's so pioneering, but he, I don't think he was that impressed. So we've now, we're now doing another 40 samples. So we originally did 10, uh, five from, with ESTEC positive and five from other things. Um, and it's all still ongoing. But here's one of the preliminary results. From an ESTEC stool metagenome, we actually aligned the reads against the, the genome sequence of the outbreak strain, and we achieved 30, around 20 to 30 fold coverage, fairly evenly throughout the genome. In fact, this slight curve, curve here is what you see because of the way in which the origin of replication is slightly overrepresented compared to the rest of the genome. And interestingly, we found a up, little upswing here. In terms of, and that's the sugar toxin encoding phage. And we know as part of the biology here that as the toxin is released, it's being released by cells that are being lysed by the virus, by the bacteriophage. And so you'd expect to see a much greater representation of the, of the phage genome than of the genomic backbone. We've been able to do MLST based on this, and we can retrieve the profile. And we can also fish out the flagella the flagellin sequences, and we can say, ah, it's an H4 as well. 
and, and, and so we've we managed to get some epidemiology and some biology out of this, and we've done this for several of these now. Um, just working out the box without much difficulty. Here's another one where we've done a similar thing, but here we've got a slightly more complex picture. And what we see here is we've got a rather higher coverage of the E. coli genome. But underneath here, you've got these other bits of the genome that are covered at a lower coverage rate. And what's actually happened here is that there are two E. coli strains in this stool specimen. And, we can, and so this is the E. coli backbone here that's common to all E. coli. And that, these things here are coming up because they're in both of them. They're coming up with this high coverage. Down here are the bits that are specific to the STEC lineage of the two lineages here coming out at a lower coverage rate. Still got the upswing here with the Farge genome. And we've been able to fish out the um, flagellin uh, sequences. And we've been able to say, OK, one's H4. The other one turns out to be an H47. Um, and so we can this all reconstructed purely from just sequencing DNA extracted from the fecal sample. So I'd like to say that we've got uh, lots of opportunities here. We've got these open-endedness, applicability, ultimate resolution, benchtop sequencing. We don't have the perfect platform yet. And so what I'm talking about here is really establishing proof of principle that these techniques can work in an idealized situation. We're not yet ready to apply them to routine use. I think we are ready in unusual cases where you have an outbreak of some unknown pathogen. Then I think it would be entirely applicable. But we're not saying it's quite ready for routine use. But you haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen nothing yet. Um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I've got time, I think. We've got this, there's this technology called Oxford Nanopore, which is a single molecule sequencing technology uh, where you can buy a little USB stick like this. You can pipette your sample into it without any library preparation. It does the sequencing and it streams the sequence off the USB stick onto your laptop. Um, now, this was presented back in February at a genomics meeting, and uh, nobody has yet actually seen this technology apart from the company. <laughs> Nobody's even seen any data from the, co the company, uh, from the technology. But I think I've just about got time to show you uh, one video which might just get you excited about where this is leading, uh, if it's true. And, uh, you know, I can't.